Amen. The power of the cross has not diminished from the first century of believers that trusted in that cross of Jesus Christ the day in which we live, and if the Lord tarries, until He would come back for us. If you turn now to Colossians chapter number 3, we'll be looking in verses 1 through 4. Some messages are very practical in the application aspect. Uh, This is not one of those. This is a message that hopefully will help us in changing the perspective through which we view our lives and through which we view God in viewing our lives. And I trust that this message will be a blessing to you in helping gain the right perspective, which will in turn impact everything that you do. Everything that you do is done for a reason. And there are motivations behind every single action. And every, You get up in the morning to go to work, there's a motivation behind that. Because you want to have a home, because you want to provide for your family. Every single thing that you do in life has a motivation. And tonight we want to look at some practical aspects of the motivation for which we serve Christ and why we do the things that we do as a Christian. As a Christian, there are two perspectives that we can embrace. The right one, which is God's perspective, has a focus that is squarely placed on the Lord Jesus Christ, His sacrifice for us, His empowerment in our daily lives. The world's perspective, which of course would be the wrong perspective, is a man-focused agenda, a man-focused perspective. And your view of what's important in life is going to drive your life. Your view of what has real value in life is going to determine what you do and how you do it. And really, we want to look at tonight and find the right perspective in this life. If you would, let's stand together and we will read Colossians chapter 3. From verse 1 down through verse 4. And the Word of God says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with Him in glory. Father, we do pray that you would take the Word of God, that you would penetrate our hearts, that you would open our understanding. Lord, that those that are in here this evening that have a wrong perspective of service to Christ, and and Lord, that so often we get into the mindset of the Christian life as simple duty and simple checklist Christianity, I pray that you would change and transform our minds. May we be renewed in the spirit of our mind by the power of your word. Lord, I pray that you would cleanse us through the washing of the water by the word. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. We first see here in this passage, in Colossians chapter number 3, starting in verse 1, we notice an upward perspective. And the proper perspective that God wants us to have in this Christian life first begins with an upward perspective. And it says there, if ye then be risen with Christ. I'm going to give you just a quick, a quick, yeah, a quick Greek lesson. I might want to work on my English before I give you some Greek lessons, but we'll give it a whirl. That word, if. In the Greek, there are things called conditions, if-then statements, and this is what's called a first-class condition. It means that for the sake of argument, we are going to assume that what follows is true. Now, what follows may actually not be true, but for the sake of argument, we're going to assume that it's true. The same kind of condition is used in 1 Corinthians 15 when it says, if Christ be not raised from the dead. Now, did Christ raise from the dead? Well, absolutely. But they're saying, for the sake of argument, just go along with this. Okay, let's say Christ didn't raise from the dead. Then your faith would be in vain. So, if, then. All right, in this passage, we have the same exact thing. And he says, if ye be risen with Christ. And what you can place in there is the idea of since or because you have been raised to new life in Jesus Christ, then this is what needs to follow. So we all catch that, this first class condition. Since you have been raised in new life, since you are risen with Christ, then we are given a command. And the command that he gives is because we are raised to this new life, we have been risen with Christ, then our response should be in verse 1, that we seek those things which are above. 
we seek those things which are above. This is the upward perspective. This is the reasonable sacrifice. This is the reasonable service that Paul writes about in Romans chapter number 12, verses 1 and 2. That it's only logical that Jesus Christ has given everything for us that we would in turn yield ourselves to Him, not living for ourselves any longer. Notice that the passage says that we are to seek those things and have a focus on things that are above. Did you realize that you can't focus on two things at once? You may be able to look at something and have other objects in your peripheral vision, but you can really only focus on one thing at a time. You know how I know that? A soccer goalie. Have you ever seen a soccer goalie and they are, they are focused on the soccer ball? You know, if they're good. If they're like six years old, they're focused on the plants and the ground and, you know, the bird flying by. But if they're a real soccer goalie, you know, they're getting older, they're, they're into some intense competition, that soccer goalie is focused squarely on that ball. And that many times is to the exclusion of everything else, including the goalposts. Now, I played soccer for a while, and I have seen a number of goalies dive headlong into a goalpost and knock themselves completely out. It was, you know, you say, well, why did they do that? Well, because they were focused on something else. They weren't focused on the goalpost. They were seeing that ball, and they were just running and running and running. As the ball got closer, what they didn't realize is that the goalpost got a little closer, too. And all of a sudden, they whack right into that goalpost. They knocked themselves out, but they had a singular focus. Now, the goalie could have kind of looked over here and made sure the goalpost was at a good distance, but you know what possibly could have happened is the ball goes right by him into the net. He has one focus, and that was on the ball. And he runs plummeting headfirst into a goalpost because he has one single focus. And a lot of times as Christians, the problem is we have singular focuses, but they are not on the things that are important. They are not on things that are above. They are not on the things of Christ, the things that God desires us to focus upon. We can't be looking up and down. We can't be looking to the Lord and trying to focus on the things of God while focusing on the things of this world. A decision needs to be made. There needs to be a point in time where we make the decision, I am going to give my life and focus my attention on things that are above and not on the things that are on this earth. What does it mean to seek those things which are above? It's a present active imperative. You know what an imperative is? You give them to your children all the time. Shut the door. Stop talking with your mouth full. Go get a shower. Go do this and do that. These are imperatives. They are not simple wishes. God says you are to seek. Because you've been raised, because you now walk in a new way, because you have been risen with Christ, now you need to seek those things which are above. It's a word of action. It is purposefully seeking after the things of God. You know why it's a command? You know why it's seek instead of, if you have time, try to seek these things? Because naturally, we have an inclination to go away from God. I think it was clear this morning that no man seeks after God. No one comes up and says, oh, this would be great. How about I forsake the paths of sin and I want to follow after God. I just want Him to be my Lord. I want Him to be my Master. That does not happen unless God has done a work in that person's heart. No man seeketh after God. No one even understands enough to begin seeking after God. And so it's a command because it doesn't come naturally. And as was mentioned this morning, even after we become Christians, it does not come naturally. You say, how do I know that? Because I know that the Apostle Paul struggled with it. He said in Romans 7, all the good things I want to do, I, I'm not doing them. All the bad things that I say, oh, I don't want to do that, that's what I find myself doing. There was a, a war going on in his members, and it was warring against the law of his mind. Everything was battling and fighting, and Paul had this struggle, and we are going to have the same exact struggle. It's an imperative that we seek, that we purposefully make the determination in our lives to seek after what the Bible says here, those things which are above, where Christ sitteth. You see, it says there, seek those things which are above. Many times the word above is used to describe God or the things of God. In James chapter 3 and verse 15, it describes fightings that are among us. And it says that those things are not from above, 
but rather they are from this earth. They are sensual, they are devilish. Again, using the idea of above to describe God. Seeking those things that are above means that we desire to do God's will and not our own. That we place our lives in submission under God's authority. That if I want to do something and it contradicts what God has planned for my life, that because I am under God's authority, I yield to His will rather than my own. And that is real easy to say. And it is real difficult to put into practice. Because we can say, yes, I'd love to serve God. I I want to honor God in my life. I want to do God's will. I want to accomplish what He has for me. Those are all great things for us to say at church. But they become a whole lot more difficult when we actually get to a point where our will conflicts with God's will. And as a Christian, you know that that takes place. You know that that takes place many times on a daily basis. Where we want it our way and we've decided that this is what's best for me. And God has made it plainly clear that this is what he has commanded and this is what he wants. And that's the time when our faith is really put to the test. That's the time where we have to put into practice that we're seeking those things which are above, where Christ sitteth. That we are really putting the, the fact of our faith into practice. It's not ambiguous God's will. It's not ambiguous of, well, you know, whatever I do, that's all part of God's will. God has a specific will for you. It involves your marriage, or for those of you that are not yet married and it's planned in the future for you, it involves that marriage. It involves colleges and jobs and friends. But beyond the grand scheme of God's will for your life, He has a daily will for you. And the Bible is clear that God's will, and there, throughout the Scripture, there are many times that it plainly says, this is the will of God for you. I mean, it can't get any easier than that. He lays it right out. This is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Sometimes it talks about abstaining from fornication or following after righteousness. But God has a specific daily will for you as well. That's a daily walk with Him. You say, how am I going to know what I'm going to do in five years? Well, you obey what God has told you to do today. And then when you get through today, you obey what God tells you to do that day. And then when you get through that day, you keep moving through. And so often, I've, I've talked to teenagers, and they think about, you know, what does God want for me way down the road? Well, that's great. They're thinking about that. They should concern themselves about that. But the most important thing that God wants from you right now is obedience today. He's not worried about whether you'll be obedient in 10 years. He wants to know, are you obedient today? The direction you're heading right now is gonna, it's going to place you in the place that you'll be in 5 or 10 years. God has a daily will for you. You need to seek to do those things which are from above. They are from God. How do you seek to do the things that God wants? Well, he's written a whole lot about what he wants from your life. He's given us the Word of God, and and please don't look at the Word of God as simply a checklist. Don't say, well, I'm going to read the Scriptures today, and I'm going to figure out all the things i got to stop doing, figure out all the things i got to start doing. That is not what God's Word is. It's not a checklist. We don't serve a checklist Christianity kind of God. It's not just, well, you did this and this and this. Okay, you've appeased me for today. God wants all of you. God wants every aspect of your life, and He wants you to obey. And we're going to talk about this later. He wants you to obey with the right motivation. And so often, we serve in a guilt-ridden Christianity. The only reason we do what we do is because we feel guilty. The only reason that we're in church or reading our Bible or doing anything that we call spiritual is because if we don't, either someone's going to make me feel guilty or I'm going to feel guilty on my own because I feel like I've messed up. And so often that guilt-ridden Christianity mentality skews the entire view of how we are to serve God and what God really wants from your life and how God really wants to take you and use you for His purpose and most of all for His glory. So we are to seek those things which are above. That is, we place God's will above our own. We allow God's will to determine the direction of our lives instead of our own will. The second thing underneath this, we see that we are to set our affections on things above. So we saw there, if ye then be risen, or since ye be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Verse 2, 
set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. What are your affections? Well, plainly, they encompass your emotions, your desires. It's the things that you love. The word that is actually translated affections here, more often than not, is translated as the word mind. Other times it's used as savorist or things that you desire. But most times this word affections is translated as the word mind. Why is that? Because you know what? The thing that you give your mind to is the thing that you will love. If you spend and devote all of your time and have been devoting all of your time from about August up through February to think about football and to check out your team, and if you're an Eagles fan, I am sorry this year, Amen. as every year, but you're, you, know, you devote yourself, you give your, I mean, if you allow those thoughts to just run through your mind constantly, you know what, you're going to love them. And people that love the Eagles, they hate them, but they love them. I mean, that is just a part of them. Anything that you give your mind to, anything that you devote your mind to think upon, to dwell upon, is going to become something that you love. And we need to realize that what God is telling us to do here is to set our mind upon things above, to set our mind on Him. Because when you set your mind on Him, you will love Him. When you give yourself and devote yourself to know God, how is it possible for someone to know about God and not love Him? To realize His mercy, to understand His grace, to realize His forgiveness, to understand in a real way that He loves us and really cares about us. Not in this general God so loved the world, but that God is intricately aware of every single thing that happens in my life. The more you get to know God, the more you will love Him. And theology, the study of God, so many people say, man, theology, it could kill a church, it can, it can do it. Listen, if you have a proper view of who God is, and you are walking with God and desiring to know God, it can only, the more you know about Him, it can only increase that love for Him. It is the only thing that it can possibly do to increase that devotion, that dedication, that love for God. The Bible says that we are to set our affections on things that are above. Well, what's the opposite of that? If we don't set our affections on things above, we are setting our affections on things below, which would be on this earth. If we place our affections in this world, we have located them in a wrong place. The desire of this world and to desire this world means enmity or variance and opposition with God. The Bible says in James 4.4, 4, Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. And those are some strong words, especially for those who desire friendship with this world. But how do we display that? How can a person display that they are a friend of the world? Because, you know, there's a lot of Christians out there who look a whole lot like the world and dress a whole lot like the world and talk a whole lot like the world, but they still want to claim to be a Christian and say, oh, I'm not a friend of the world. Oh, no, I love God just as much as I ever did. How can we determine if someone is a friend of the world? Well, if you subscribe to their dress the worldly style that dictates standards instead of that which becometh godliness, or you fill your mind with the videos and the movies and all the things that go on instead of filling your mind with the Word of God, if your speech is that which tears down instead of build, building up, if these things are consistent in your life, then the Bible is clear, if you're running with them, you are a part of them. Right. If that has filled your life and filled your mind, you have become a friend to that world that God has commanded us to re refrain from and to keep away from. A person who thinks like, talks like, looks like, and acts like the world, they shouldn't fool themselves. They are a friend of the world. If during the Civil War there was a Union soldier that was captured, and he claimed at least to be a Union soldier, but the people that cap captured him, the Union Army that captured him, although he claims to be a Union soldier, they said, well, it's kind of strange that you are saying that you're a Union soldier because we saw you on the Confederate side and we noticed 
that you were with them for a number of battles, and we also notice that you actually were shooting at the Union Army. That's kind of strange that you want to claim to be a Union soldier. Now, would that, would that fly? No, that wouldn't spare him from anything. But Christians do the same thing so often. We're running with the world. We're acting like the world. Maybe not on Sundays, but we're talking like the world. We're thinking like the world. We allow the world's philosophies to penetrate and permeate our minds. Don't be fooled. That one that seeks after that is on the wrong side. They are following after the world. How do you move from being a friend of the world to being a friend of God, to being one that walks with God? Well, again, you set your affections. You set your mind on those things which are above. You fill your mind with Christ and you get rid of everything else. Now, does that mean you're going to go home and bash your TV? For some of you, that may be something that's necessary. I'm not bashing mine. I don't get any reception on it. Is that, is that what it is? Just, okay, everybody just go home and, you know, let's, let's all, let's try to get into a monastery and rid ourselves of anything that we deem worldly. Now, we're not saying that, but what we are saying is that you fill your mind with Christ, that you follow after what he says is godly and righteous and honoring. And you know what? A lot of things in your life are going to go away. A lot of things that are questionable, a lot of things that are sinful, will be taken aside and taken out of the way. You know, I remember growing up, and we didn't really, it was kind of a Christian home. We didn't go to church. My parents were saved, and later on when I was about 15, you know, we, we really finally started going to church, and I had gotten saved when I was 15 years old, and we continued in that. You know, I grew up in just a normal, worldly, philosophical, driven home. You know, we followed the, the music that the world listened to, and we did the things that the world did, and listened to what they listened to, and watched what they watched, and everything we did was just normal because that was just the way of life. But you know the thing that I found that was amazing? As I drew closer to Jesus Christ, all the things that the world had to offer began to fade away. The appearance of all that gold and glitter that looked so appealing began to just pass away. You know what? Because Jesus Christ became more beautiful. Because my love for him grew and it intensified. And all the things of this world grew strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. As I developed my relationship with him and as I grew in my love for him, it didn't come to a point where I said, whoa, that's enough. I've had enough of that. I've learned all I can learn about him. I've got it all figured out. I've read through the Bible that whole one time, and you know, it's all taken care of. No, it built something inside of me that said, I want more. I need more. And whether it's giving this up or giving that up, it's not a matter of, oh, the preacher made me do it. Or it's not a matter of, well, I feel guilty, so I better do this. It's a matter of, I desire to know Christ. And if it means giving anything up, that's more than worth it. I'm willing to follow him. question is, where have you placed your affections. You see it says there that Paul says, since if you are risen with Christ, you should be doing these things. Number one, you are to set, or rather seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. And number two, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Second Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 14 gives us the motivation for this. If you go away from here and say, okay, well, I'll get rid of everything in my life that isn't pleasing to God. If you do it out of a guilt mentality or out of just, well, that, that's what the preacher said to do. If you do it for that reason, you'll be doing it for the wrong reason. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 14 that the love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Amen. The motivation in that verse is clear. It's not because a pastor told you to. It's not because a preacher on TV told you to. It's not because you feel guilty about it. It's because the love of Christ constrains you. It pushes you on to desire that relationship with him that only a life of sacrifice and service to the Lord can bring. We've seen the upward perspective. Now I want to take a moment and look at the frontward perspective. So the upward perspective, we seek things that are above. We set our affections 
on things that are above. And the next two verses are really the undergirding truth that propels us to do the first two things that we talked about. Seeking those things that are above and setting our affections on things that are above. And this is the frontward perspective. Look what it says there in verse 3. For, again, anytime you see for, look at what's coming before. Okay, set your affections on things above and not on things on the earth. For, this is the reason, for ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. It's a past life that is forgotten. He says you are dead. This is not the idea of forgetting our past sinfulness, but rather moving forward and now living for the Lord. You know, many people dwell on their past sin. They look at their lives and say, oh, I, I blew it here and I blew it there. And, you know, I don't think God could ever use me or God would ever want to use me. I, you think about the life of the Apostle Paul. He had a lot of things to forget about. He had a lot of sin that could have held him back and that people could have said, well, why are you serving God? Don't you remember murdering Christians? Or has that slipped your mind? Don't you remember that you blasphemed Jesus Christ? Don't you remember these things? And yet Paul, over and over again, says, Listen, I'm forgetting those things which are behind. I am pressing forward to the mark for the prize of the high calling of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Those things didn't hold him back. And he was dead. He said in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Can you hear a question in there almost? I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless, I live. How is that possible? People understood what crucifixion was. You did not walk away after being crucified. You were dead. There was nothing more. And yet, Paul here is saying, I have been crucified. I have died, and yet I'm living. So what does he mean by that? Well, he goes on. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live... All right, you want to talk about the life I'm living now? He says, The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The idea is connected here with our life being hid with Christ and God. We are dead to our past life. And now we walk in a new life. We are given newness of life. We are born again. The regeneration has made us new, the regeneration of the Holy Spirit. And it's connected with this idea that our life is now hid with Christ in God. I love that phrase. It says our life is hid with Christ in God. It doesn't say we're in Christ in God. We are with Christ in God. You know what that means? We are special, but not because of who we are. It's because of who we're with. We are with Christ. And when God looks upon us, He sees Christ by our side. That's why the Bible says that we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ because we are in God right next to His Son. We are joined with His Son. We are now with Christ. It has changed us. It has transformed us. The last thing that we see here in verse number 4 is future glory with Jesus Christ realized. So the last point that we looked at is describing our present state. Our life, we are no longer living for ourselves. Our motivation now is to look for and look toward the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And this is the future glory that is to be realized. Verse number four, when Christ, who is our life, that's a convicting phrase, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. You say, well, who is our life? That, that must be just talking about our eternal life. Well, that may be the case. And in John chapter 17, and verse 3, Jesus tells us what eternal life is. He says, and this is eternal life. When you die, you go to heaven, you go on the streets of gold, and you get your mansion, you see angels. That's what's eternal life. No, he actually says this. He says, this is eternal life. That they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. He says eternal life begins when you establish a relationship with Jesus Christ. And you enjoy that eternal life from that moment for all of eternity. That's why it's eternal life. And that's why once he gives you eternal life, he'll never take it away. 
That's why he says, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Because they're enjoying that eternal life right then. The moment they receive it, they've been given an eternal gift. They've been given eternal life. We see here the statement that Jesus, when he shall appear, who is our life. Again, that, like I said, is a convicting statement. The question is, is Jesus Christ your life? First of all, is he your Savior? Have you entered into that special relationship with Jesus Christ that he has taken away your sins, that he has made you his child? We are not born into the family of God, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. We are not automatically born into God's family. We have to be reborn into the family of God. We need to be born again, as Jesus told Nicodemus. Has he become your Savior? Do you know of a certainty that you are on your way to heaven? 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13 makes it as clear as can be. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. And when you know that, when you have that assurance, your relationship with Christ can then begin to flourish. I've seen so many people who have struggled questioning, am I saved? Am I going to heaven? What's going to happen to me when I die? I prayed a prayer, but I'm not sure if I meant it and if I didn't meant it enough. And, and they go through it and they make themselves crazy. And all the while, the relationship with God never grows because they're never on a sure footing. If you've been wrestling with your salvation, I will guarantee you that you're not growing as a Christian. And if you are not a Christian to begin with, then it's something that needs to be dealt with. And so, if you are wrestling with that, if you don't know for sure that you're on your way to heaven, God wants you to be planted. He wants you to be established so that you then can begin to grow. Once you take root, you can begin to flourish and grow as a Christian. But has there been a point where Jesus Christ has given you eternal life, that He has saved you, He's washed your sins away, and He has offered you and given to you that eternal home in heaven? First of all, He is, is our life. He is our Savior. But we move on from there. So it says, when Christ, who is our life, the second thing that He should be, not just our eternal life in the respect of going to heaven when we die, but He also ought to be our focus. We talked earlier that it's easy to focus on everything else in life. It's even easy for me to focus on ministry without focusing on Christ. It's easy to focus on family without focusing on Christ. And both are good. I'm not saying, well, I just better give up ministry, I better give up my family so I can faithfully serve the Lord. No, those are both profitable things, but the focus of my life needs to be squarely upon Jesus Christ. How do you make Jesus the focus of your life? A lot of times we get this idea, well, you know, I just got to feel it, you know? I got I to gotta feel like reading my Bible. I got I to gotta feel like coming to church. I got to feel like telling my friends about the Lord Jesus Christ. I got to feel like staying pure. I got to feel, listen, feelings have nothing to do with it. It's a decision and a determination that God, by your grace, I will obey you whether I feel like it or not. Whether it feels good to me or not. We live in a society that if it feels good, do it. The Bible is completely opposed to that. It's not about our feelings. And really, in the long run of things, our feelings matter very little. God desires to use us. He desires to take our lives in obedience. And the amazing thing is that I found in my life, when I obey, God sends the feelings following. The feelings come after. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and He shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Why? Because you first obeyed. You first delighted yourself in the Lord. Have you made Jesus and your relationship with Him, the priority over everything. The question is, what does someone who has the right perspective in life look like? What do they look like on the outside? You say, well, is that legalistic? No. Jesus said, by this shall all men know you're my disciples. He said, by an outward visible sign, people will be able to tell that you're a believer. So, what does a Christian who has the right perspective on the outside look like? Well, certainly they'd be consistent in attending church, in desiring the things of the Lord. He will have the joy of the Lord even in the midst of suffering. That when we go through trials, that God's peace and God's joy is undergirding us, it is upholding us. 
It is one who tells others about the Lord, who enjoys witnessing and sharing their faith in Christ. They stay away from the world and the things of this world. And he spends time with the Lord. But you know what? Each of those things can be done by someone with the wrong perspective, with the wrong attitude that still is a Christian. You know what the difference is? The one that is doing it with the right perspective does it not based on guilt, but he does it based on love. I want you to note some things in the passage that we just read. How can we shift our focus? How can we shift our focus from, well, I better do this or I'm going to feel guilty about it. Or someone's going to get on my case. I want you to notice some of the things that Paul brings out. Really just a preposition. He says in verse 1, chapter 3, verse 1 here, If ye then be risen with Christ. And then he says there in verse number 3, For ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ. And in verse 4, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him. You know what the difference is? The difference is the fact that we realize, you know what, Lord, you have done so much for me. You have brought me out of sin. I am raised to new life with you, with Christ. And now my life is hid with you, Jesus, in God the Father. And Lord, when you appear, I'm going to be right by your side. And the book of Revelation tells us that in chapter 20 and verse 6 that we will reign a thousand years with him. And then it says in chapter 22 and verse 5 that we will reign forever with him. And when we focus on what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us, and we set our gaze not upon all the troubles that we've got, and not upon all the things that we have to do or that we think we've got to do to please God. Listen, Jesus Christ pleased God above and beyond what you could ever do. Jesus Christ is enough. His punishment, what He took on the cross, was sufficient. It's enough for you. You can't add anything to that. But out of a heart of thankfulness, not duty and guilt, out of a heart of thankfulness, you can say, Lord, the life that I now live in this flesh, I'm going to live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That I'm going to place Jesus Christ and my love for him at the forefront of my heart, that I will honor him and that I will serve him. Has there been a point in your life where you have committed yourself to wholeheartedly seek after the Lord? Has there been a time when you have dedicated your life to say, Lord, I know that there are a lot of things in this world that want to seek my attention, but I want to have one focus. I want to seek those things which are above. And I want to set my affections on those things which are above. Has there been a point where you've done that? But then, after you've made that decision, have you let it slip? Have you started focusing on all the things that go on around you? Have you started looking and and being distracted and really detracted away from that one focus of having Jesus Christ as a central theme in your life? If so, make the commitment tonight to say, Lord, I want to get back on track. I've made that commitment. I've made that decision. But Lord, I know that there are things that are detracting me away from you. And I need to get back to having one focus in this life. Not because I feel guilty about it, but, but because I love you. Because of what you've done for me and how you've sacrificed for me.